and the sky is pounding away And there's so much to say A face, a voice An overdub has no choice An image cannot rejoice Wanting to be To hear and to see I got a question for you. Yeah. When you went circus boy. <laughs> I don't know, whatever you'll see. Now, without further ado, I'd like to bring out 
Michael Nesman and Mickey Douglas and Star. Michael goes to straighten his tie in the mirror, 
and then all the TV screens pop up. There's a gigantic cut of the movie. They lifted a big sequence out of it in which all four of the monkeys went up to the mirror and they all spoke to the mirror and they also saw themselves in their alter egos. Uh, Mickey is pan with furry pants and no shirt and a little zither and Michael is a Marvel man and uh, Peter Pagliacci and Davy is an Errol Flynn type. And they had this entire sequence edited together and Rafelson decided at some point to take the entire thing out of the movie. Now, immediately when I saw this thing, I said, oh my god, the whole thing is put together? I mean, this is going to be incredible. And they said, it is so, it's such bad shape, it's shrunken down beyond the point where you can actually even put it through a projector. It actually probably needs to be scanned in frame by frame. And at that point, Bob Rickleson said, this stuff is just too silly. We, I don't want any part of this. It's full plug. So, all that footage, gone. And the sec second big part of the movie that's missing is at the very end, you see them escape from the boxes. And they have various ways of getting out of the boxes, each of them individual. Uh, he, Michael Nesbitt is portrayed as a con man. He cons his way out of the box. He sees an odd job, Carol Sakata type character, and says, hey, you've got very big muscles. And let me, let me, uh, hey, look at those. And then they, he tosses away out of the box. All these things. Rickleson at some point also said, you know, I don't think people need to see that. We'll just pull all that out of the movie, too. So I think what he was basically doing was kind of playing a big game of Jenga with the movie. Like, how many things can I pull out of this movie and then still have it kind of make sense? Or have anybody sort of be that distracted by it? But the, uh, the movie itself was shot in um, 1968, the same year that we're celebrating. And principal photography began on February 16th, 1968, with the scenes with them kissing uh, Mimi Mushu, who was Jack Nicholson's girlfriend at the time, who wrote to us and wanted to be here tonight, but couldn't make it. She's living in Oregon now, but sends her regards to everybody. And the final scene shot were in Salt Lake City. And uh, so you saw a lot of the stills that Henry Dills had of that, which was all the scenes for Circle Sky. So between those months, they shot the movie around Los Angeles, and also they went to the Bahamas and shot uh, Paradise Island. The underwater sequences with the mermaids, with the uh, all the paint on their face, could have been in a swimming pool here in Los Angeles, but they went to the Bahamas. <laughs> so. Now, do we have, yes? Yeah. I would like to bring up the stars of Ed once again, Mr. Michael Nesman. And <laughs> Uh, 
that, was that technology in place at that time, or? Uh, how did it start, the whole? Yeah, yeah. Um, my recollection was the show was uh, being canceled, and uh, uh, I remember Bob Rathelson coming up to me and saying, we want to do a movie, and do you want it, uh, what do we want to do? And uh, I'm just, I can only speak for myself, by the way, it's important that uh, uh, there's no monkey group uh, opinion about all this. It was um, uh, individuals. And I said, uh, oh, cool. Um, and I remember somebody, Bob or whoever, saying, you know, we, we don't necessarily want it to be a, a 90 minute ex uh, episode where Davy falls in love with, uh, you know, somebody and we get him out of trouble. And uh, I was like, cool, <laughs> good idea. And we can also address issues and things that we were not allowed to do on the television show because of the network uh, sensors uh, control. So we can talk about things and do, do things and that we might not have been able to do on the series. I personally remember vaguely, and it is very vaguely. Uh, yeah, that was cool, man. That's, you know. The next thing I remember is uh, Bob introducing us to a, a gentleman named Jack Nicholson, who was a, um, uh, from what I gather, a B-movie actor at the time. I mean, uh, you know, Roger Corman. He ran with that crowd, you know, the Harry Dean Stanton and a whole bunch of those guys, all Ed, Ed Roche and the guys up and down the canyons. Yep. And he was, uh, I don't know what this thing is. It happens in Hollywood. There's a, there's this whole great, let's call it great B-level actor who play in low budget movies, take a very little salary, and uh, they uh, just go on to the next one, unheralded. And slowly, if you're in the community, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, I don't know how to explain it other than this. Slowly, those people who have turned in good work begin to get recognized by their peers. Get some traction. They do, they get some traction. And they get invited to dinner, and they're, and they're pleasant to be with, and they're successful in their own right. Harry Dean Stanton was one of those guys, yep. and Nicholson was the king of those guys. Yep. He was, you know, he, first of all, he's hilarious. I love hanging out with the guy. And second of all, he's wicked smart, which also was fun to hang out with. And then he was, he was the lord of this third ring and this other tier. The independent yeah. guys who did not exist in the Hollywood major studio system. Right. If you were not at MGM, Columbia, uh, University, you didn't make your deal there. Uh, you didn't have a deal. Uh, there were very few breakthroughs. Uh, Billy Jack is an example who, I'm, I was just, Billy Jack was, uh, he was an actor and a producer director. And he, I still haven't heard the name. Tom 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 Billy Tom Jack. Tom. <laughs> you guys don't know. Billy Jack? He's yelling stuff at me. Who knows Billy Jack? A lot of people. See? Very unusual. Very interesting because Billy Jack, pre Rafelson, Nicholson, uh, all these people, uh, pre them, was trying to break through to the uh, uh, film industry without going through the major film distributing companies. Because not only did MGM make the films, they owned the studios. This was the major film industry. And if you weren't part of that, you really had a tough time. Uh, unless you've got some breakthrough like Dr. No from Rank Films or, or uh, you know, very, very seldom could you get 
a film distributed. You could get it made with your own money and your angels and your investors, but you could not get it shown because the studios controlled it. So along comes these young bucks, uh, Frank, uh, uh, sorry, Jack Nicholson, Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, uh, Mark Scorsese. I did an interview for a book called uh, Easy Rider, Raging Bull, right. uh, about this. And it was about the fact that these young bucks came up and they were trying to push against, bump against, this major film studio industry. And if you weren't part of it, it was really, really tough. Well, Bert Schneider, the exact on the money, was packing serious heat because his father owned Columbia Pictures. So, so that helped. <laughs> right. Eventually, eventually that really, really helped. Bert, so, now, Bert Schneider, of course, was the co-creator with Bob Rickleson, who's the director of this movie, of the Monkey series. He was able to green light the Monkey's television series even after it tested badly because his father had juice on that. And he was able to give the Monkey's their freedom to make their own records because his father had the juice on that. So he was pushing down the door from the inside and his friends were Jack Nicholson, and Dennis Hopper, and Peter Fonda. And you gotta give credit to people like Jackie Cooper, who was running Screen Gems. Uh, uh, television at the time, and they all they all must have like got you know like, they must have thought you know maybe, maybe this could go, but it was only a, a, a pilot. We didn't necessarily would have even got the pilot. I was up for three other pilots that year about music uh, music shows. It was in the air. I was up for like 34. After how many? 34. And they all failed? <laughs> and they all failed? They all failed. Well, I don't know if you call it failing exactly. Nobody <laughs> ever saw it. I never paid the money well, for it. Is that a failure? I, I was up for three as an official. My agent called and said, go to an audition. One was like a beach boy. Uh, a uh, surfing show. I don't remember the name. Why did you, know. why did you point to them? Well, I was, my agent said, you know, there's a new series. You surf? No. <laughs> Come on, No. But you know, I had to surf. It's my gorgeous beach body. Somebody's stuntman was surfing. I'm sorry, right back to you. I was confused. No. That, is, that was what was called the pilot season uh, in television. And um, it, that happened every spring. And there was a surfing show that I went up for. There was a Peter, Paul, and Mary kind of folk. folk right, the, the Happeners. Thing, the Happeners. That did go to pilot. Right. That did not sell. And there was another one like this big Christie minstrel, Randy Sparks, Mighty Wind. <laughs> that was actually the end of the Troubadour, but the Survivors, I think. That was you, right? That was the TV show. What? <laughs> well, let's flash forward to the Genesis of Ed, which a year after you guys get cast in this pilot, which happens in November of 65, a year later you're so successful that not only are you, Mickey, directing episodes and you, Michael, producing records that are million, multi-million sellers, but you get invited to go try and craft this major motion picture in Ojai. Ness, what do you remember about going to Ojai to do these writing sessions for Head? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we, we, we stayed pretty stacked up that whole weekend. <laughs> but these were good conversations. Oh, yeah. I had totally I got footage of this song, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, but, but it, you know, we exchange stories. Yeah. And, and this is, and, no, wait, this is gonna, this is gonna sound creepy, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it. But movies, movies are about telling stories. And that's what we were doing. Now, stop it. <laughs> I know how dumb that sounds, but it is, it was a moment for me where I realized, okay, this thing 
is going to turn into some kind of a story. That's all I have. Well, what I want to know is from that weekend, can you remember anything? Well, I mean, can you remember anything? But no, can you remember anything that might have ended up on the street? I think, I think in your book, you talk a bit about, about one of the jokes that might Oh, is that my book there? Which is available outside. Uh, by the way. But didn't you come up with a Yes. Well, I asked Bob, what did you want us to do while well, we're up here? He said, we'll just riff. Dude, we'll just tell each other stories and everything. And, and Nicholson was the king of riffing. Right. I mean, if he hits you in your funny bone with one of his major riffs, you were laughing for days. And then you'd wake up in the middle of the night laughing. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was sort of the ringleader of it because he kept us all really high. And he was laughing like crazy. I mean, breathlessly laughing. Right. So it was it was more we exchanged these stories about well just tell a joke. I said, I don't know any jokes. He said, Oh sure you do. What about that joke you told me about the uh, Arab that was waiting on a camel in the back of the alley for somebody that he was gonna and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, Yeah, you know, he goes the guy comes up and he said, Psst and then he was real close to me and the guy goes, Psst. And look at Rickleson lost it. <laughs> he started laughing like I would Jack's jokes. <laughs> and I said, well, if it's that funny, then put it in. <laughs> so, so, Mickey, did you have any similar things or any ideas that you had in that Ojai weekend, the brainstorming weekend that ended up on the screen? Well, for me, it started before Ojai. Jack came over to the house a number of times. Right. And hang out. Just sat by the pool. We, you know, kind of talked and and and, and maybe smoked a little. <laughs> right. So, and I, in retrospect, I realized what he was doing was he was getting an insight to each of our personalities, our intimate lifestyle, our person, our thoughts, and. I guess that's what he and Bob had decided to do, to really find Well, and to this day, I wondered, what on earth did they want to do that for? <laughs> well, but, because I think, in, in, in my retrospect, I think they wanted to uh, create a story about the monkeys and us and the deconstruction of it. And to me, skipping ahead maybe light years, to me, the movie head uh, is about the deconstruction of not the, just the monkeys, but the deconstruction of the Hollywood major studio system. There's one scene in the movie, uh, Mike and I uh, starred in it, and it was uh, that cowardly scene. Uh, we're being shot by Indians in a covered wagon. Terry Gar, her first, I believe, her first yeah. Yeah. Uh, is hit with an arrow and she's not. And Mike and I are cavalry officers and we're like being shot at them. And we're like, oh, what are we going to do? And, 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 and Terry Gar is like, suck the blood from my thumb or something. <laughs> and uh, at quick. the end of that. It was quick. Suck it before it reaches my heart. Yes. <laughs> Suck it before it reaches my heart. <laughs> and I stand up in the middle of this scene with a great set and a backdrop of the Rocky Mountains or something. And I stand up and I finally go, Bob, Bob Rafelson, the director. I broke the third wall, and I say, a fourth wall, and I break the fourth wall, and I go, Bob, I can't do this anymore. This is ridiculous. These fake arrows, and I get hit with like four fake arrows, and I break them off, and I'm going, this is, I can't take this anymore. This is bullshit, crap. I don't use those words, but that was the intent. And I turn around, and you just saw it, I walk through the back of the set, and I go through the backdrop, the scrim, they call them, 
of the painting of the Wild West, and I break through, and I'm like, I'm done. This is crap. I'm finished. That, to me, is the essence, the spine, the theme of what they were speaking to, the intent, breaking down the old, traditional Hollywood uh, paradigm. Right. They were saying, we are, this is not working for us anymore. We're going to fuck the, uh, sorry. <laughs> they probably did say that, but yeah. yeah. Fuck the fake stuff, the whole Hollywood that had to do with having Victor Mature there, who was a wonderful actor, by the way. And I think he got it. I know he got it. Because I talked to him on the set. He had done a movie with my father many, many years ago. He got it. He got it. This is breaking down this old Hollywood school, uh, Hollywood school system. And this book, Easy Writer, Raging Bull, is all about this for Bob Burt, Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, Martin Scorsese had broken down this old school. Hollywood system, and they essentially, with Easy Rider mainly, created the Hollywood independent film industry. Right, what, which is known as the new Hollywood. And Penn is really the first salvo in that battle for the screen. Now, Ness, I believe that you were responsible for getting Victor Mature actually in the movie, whereas Jack and Bob and Bert maybe thought about it in a moment. You actually made it happen. Yeah, those guys were Twinkies when I came to <laughs> Well, I just met uh, Victoria. Did, is your last name Mature as well? I, I failed yes. to ask. Oh, so Victoria and Mature, we met and talked for a little bit. I told her the story. It's in, the, it's in my latest book. What's that called? It's Tuesday. Well, that that. The best selling paperback. Available on Amazon? Yes. And, and all fine merch sellers outside. <laughs> so I'll set the scene. We're in Bob's office. Bob, I'm sorry, Bert's office. Bert had a corner desk. The feet all ways up. The office is luxurious in a kind of, I guess, shabby chic way because they invented shabby chic. Before there was shabby sheep. I think they were shabby before there were sheep. So they were they had something to do with it. His office was like that. Real comfortable pillows all over the place. And Bob was in there. They both had their feet on the desk. They were both smoking a joint. And they were talking about the fact that they thought the movie had a shot at being something really good and they wanted to make sure that they made the movie very well. So they were hunting around for these actors that would bring something to the film. And they said, and we found our guy, Victor Mature. <laughs> and I said, who? <laughs> and he said, well, and they said, well, he's a, he's a, he's a fine actor, he's in some great movies, and he's not working right now, and he might be receptive to this. And uh, we're, we'll find out, you know, we'll tell him what we're doing, tell him what we intend to do, and see if he has any interest in it. And I said, well, when are you going to do this? I said, well, we'll give him a call. And I said, well, when are you going to give him a call? And they said, well, maybe tomorrow, the next day. Why are you waiting? Why don't you call him now? Yeah. And, they, and, and I thought, well, maybe they don't have their number. I said, you got his number? And they said, yeah, I've got his number. And he gives, gives it to me out of his pocket. And I said, well, why don't, why don't we just call him up right now? And Rainbowson says, <laughs> as a serious alpha male move. He says, oh really? Well, why don't you call him? <laughs> <laughs> That's the number in my chest. So I grabbed it, and I thought, well, what the hell? So I dialed the number on Bert's phone. Bob and Bert are looking at each other with a smirk. They called, Bob called me Nishwash out of, out of the show. <laughs> and he said, uh, and, and the, phone, the phone rings, I'm on it. And, uh, and Victor Mature answers the 
phone. And I recognized his voice. Al, I don't know, but I recognized his voice. Hello? And I said, uh, Mr. Mature? He said, yes. I said, my name is Mike Christmas, and I'm in a television show about a rock and roll band. And we've been on the air for a season now, which is going to come to a close of the season. And we're going to take our hiatus to do a movie. And it, we would really love it if you could find your way to come down and play a part of it. He said, well, what kind of part is it? And I said, well, I don't know. You should probably talk to the producer. <laughs> <laughs> so by this time, Bob has been looking over at Bert and going, bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit, man. He's not on the phone. He's, not, he's talking to an empty line. Come on, Nick Schwash, you're fucking with us, man. I know no lights over there. I'm sorry, Mr. Mature. And then fucking just hand it to Bert. Hand it to the phone to Bert. I see he's a liquor partner. Go do what you can. And they, and they worked out the deal, and the next thing you know, Mature's on the set driving a little car around. <laughs> the magic of movies. Okay, thanks. You got it? Now, yeah, the, the movie itself exhibits a lot of hostility towards the two of you guys and the monkeys in general. How the audience perceives you, they're going to come on stage and rip your partner plastic mannequins, and, and you, everybody's going to flee a diner just because you go sit down to have a meal. That just happened to us now. Uh, it, were there any things that you were asked to do in the movie, Mickey, that you felt were sort of difficult or, or tense? I mean, not beyond your capabilities, but, but just like, why are they asking me to do this? I don't remember anything um, I loved. The, I love the movie. I, I still do. I, I, I'm not sure what it's all about necessarily, except for this deconstruction of, uh, metaphorically, the deconstruction of the Hollywood studio system through, through the monkeys, uh, right. which I do think, I hope, I think was part of their intent. If not, it became the intent. And sometimes that happens. You know, you do make a movie with one. Uh, idea in mind with one intent in mind. And it comes out very, very different. And a, a great example is the musical Mamma Mia. The original con the, uh, construction, the original idea was it was going to be incredibly dramatic. You know, Shakespearean and you know, right. drama. They, they, you know, it's about a little girl trying to find her father, which was probably Aristophanes or something. But somebody along the line, when people started laughing during the production and the, the previews, right. somebody wisely said, okay, let's, let's go for the comedy relief, which they did. And I think that might be a little bit of what happened with the movie head. I don't know exactly what Bob and Bert had in mind, except I do think it had to do with the deconstruction of the Hollywood Sure. You know, and, and, and the monkeys used as metaphor. They did that also in 33 and the third revolution. Right. Which, which, which post, was post the, uh, the project right after Head, which Bert and Bob actually were not really involved with. No. But the, the thing I was going to ask you about, sort of to highlight this, about 10 years ago, as you and I, when we were doing the Criterion Collection, we talked about the scene with the execution of the Vietnamese man in the street and how it was multiplexed in your song, Circle Sky, and the feelings that you had about it, the, how you were kind of reviled by it initially, and, and how you asked uh, Bert and Bob what their intent was. Do you, do you want to talk about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I can't unpack it too far because it's, it's obscure to me a little bit. But when I was in the first screening that I saw, they had full screen the, 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 the uh, I, I want to introduce you, Stark and Ushin. They thing. just saw it. But uh, oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't know if you didn't see it because it didn't ever make it in the movie. The, uh, uh, it was a full screen and of the guy assassinating the, uh, the whatever he was, a crook or whatever, in, in the Vietnam War. And so uh, jarred me 
that I couldn't watch the rest of the movie. I, it, it wouldn't go here. I mean, it doesn't go here. So it really wouldn't go here. And I, I just had a hard time, you know, walking up the endless stairways that went nowhere. And finally just abandoned. I went to Bert and I said, Bert, that assassination scene, you know, we're watching a live murder on the screen. It's the size of a screen. And I don't, do you think this is a good idea? And apparently I was one of a few dozen people that said that to him. And so he backed away and he said, well, all right, we'll, we'll come up with something. I said, I think you know, you just take it out. It, it, you know, just sends a downer to the whole film. And Bert was, no, it's, it's anti-war. And it'll have a big effect on the war. And it'll help us pull out of Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you may have been right. I don't know. Yeah. Bert, um, God love him, God rest his soul, uh, obviously, as many, many of you know or not, Bert was very, very politically uh, motivated and very, uh, I can say it, very, very left wing motivated, very against the war. Uh, as many more. And in the movie Head, I remember being actually approached and said, you know, we can do something here that means something that is beyond a monkey episode where Davey falls in love and we get him out of trouble. And the NBC uh, censors uh, standards and practices. We couldn't say or do anything. There's a very famous uh, story about an episode called The Devil and Peter Tor. Wow. And it actually happened. That was essentially Faust. Peter had sold his soul to the devil to be able to play the harp. Wonderful idea. Great episode. Total Faust ripoff. <laughs> or damn Yankees or whatever. And uh, there was a scene in the script which I think I have a line. Uh, Peter, you can't sell your soul to the devil because if you die, you'll go to hell. That was the line. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, NBC standards and practices came back and said, you can't say that. What do you mean? You can't say the word hell on 7.30 network television. And Bob, if I'm not mistaken, I heard he went to New York. I mean, he fought. He went and said, this is Faust in this right. classic you know, literature. And they said, no, I'm sorry. You, you can't use that word hell on, on television. And so if I'm not mistaken, uh, during the episode now, and I think it's me that says, Peter, you can't sell your soul to the devil because you won't be able you you go to this place where we can't say on network television. <laughs> we were under the gun. I mean, on network television in those years, you couldn't say or do much of anything. Uh, and when Head came along, the movie, uh, I remember Bob and Bert saying, you know, now we can talk about some things that we were not able to talk about. And the monkeys was never about massive revolution and, and you know, coming up with all this, you know, uh, political or, or social appeal. That's not what it was about. Ever was and probably should never be. It's, that's not what it was. Right. It's the Mars Brothers. You know. there's, a, there's a lot of darkness and light in the movie. You really see that with a lot of light, light art moments, and very dark moments, and certainly Bert and Bob were both provocateurs. Bert later went on and did a fascinating documentary about Vietnam called Hearts and Minds. Yeah. The last time I spoke to Bert Schneider, it was 10 years ago, he was going to come here to see Head with everybody, but he said, I found a screening of Hearts and Minds, and I think really politically that's where his, yeah. his heart really was. Yeah. Now, you won, he won the Academy Award for that. He did, and he sent somebody in his place. Uh, not the, uh, so everybody take a look at that if you can and maybe get some more insight into Bert and uh, what he was doing. You shot around Los Angeles primarily for this movie, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. 
who shot the war sequences in Bronson Canyon. Uh, do you remember in Bronson Canyon you shot the war sequences and then every movie it was shot in Bronson Canyon. <laughs> And then the next you saw a circus boy episode. <laughs> John Bronson Canyon. The uh, obviously the opening and closing of the movies at the Vincent Thomas Bridge in San Pedro that you run down, and then uh, also the scenes in the factory are at the Hyperion Sewage Treatment Plant in Playa del Rey. <laughs> which, fun fact, if you go online, you can take a tour of. The sewage factory that you were quite welcoming, I learned today. Uh, and also you went to Palm Springs where you shot the stuff on the sand dunes. Do you remember going out to Palm Springs and the, you blowing up the Coke machine? Yeah. <laughs> Vicky is actually, there's a, there's a scene in the movie where Vicky's had trouble hearing and... I'm tuning, tuning in my hearing aid. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, do you remember that? Because it was nearby. Um, what do you think I, they meant by blowing up the Coke machine? What, what were you, what were you uh, trying to do there? I wasn't trying to, to do anything. That was right. part of the script. <laughs> and, you know, Bob said, you're going to blow up the Coke machine. <laughs> but some of this, if not a lot, came out of these uh, discussions that Nez referred to in Ojai. Um, and I don't recall them word for word, but I did take footage of us talking. I didn't get the uh, the sound. The, those now, tapes, Nez, didn't you those tapes, tapes, those tapes, Nez locked in the trunk of his car <laughs> until they said they're going to give us some kind of credit. Because even though Jack crafted and a really cool strip. Uh, we, we did have a lot to do with it, and it was, from what I remember, it was, what do you guys want to do? What do you don't want to do? What works? What doesn't? What, what's kind of cool? What's fun? What, and uh, so we absolutely had, I would say, a significant, not word for word dialogue necessarily, but we had a lot to do with the essence, the intent, the spirit of it. Yeah. Right. When you were on set, I, I know um, we talked in the past about one specific incident that happened when you were shooting the movie, which, as provocative as Bert and Bob and Jack were, is kind of amusing or interesting at this point, which is that when you're in the vacuum cleaner and you see a marijuana cigarette, as it was known then, you couldn't say that. And say to join no, things. it wasn't we couldn't say it, I remember. It was that we chose not to say it. Um, that's how I remember it. Do you remember that bit? Oh, no. <laughs> do, do you remember oh, that? Earth yeah. calling Nez. Earth calling. Just a minute, I'm talking to Mickey, but crying out loud. <laughs> I, I remember, remember there was a debate about whether or not we acknowledge, because you've got to remember this is 68, still a felony. <laughs> um, what was a felony? What? What was a felony? <laughs> to talk or smoke, uh, buy or sell marijuana. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I said one step ahead the whole way. No, it was still an issue uh, at the time. And um, I do remember, just from my point of view, I remember there was an issue. Do we acknowledge what it was by name, or do we just blow past it? Or, yeah. It was, that was, it was a, a debate. It was a big debate. It was a debate. Did it come out like it came out in the film? Yeah, yeah we decided. You called it El Zumo. It was your line. Oh, we're looking at El Zumo, yeah. El Zumo? Yeah, we called, we called it an El Zumo. I wrote El Zumo. <laughs> the Academy would like to acknowledge it. <laughs> now, now, as I'm going to leave this to you, uh, we saw in the movie a brief minute of silence with a head on the screen, and many of you have seen movie posters and advertisements. 
What if a guy named John Brockman can you explain who John Brockman is? Well, first and foremost, he is my literary agent for this book. <laughs> you may have seen it earlier in this program. What's it called? Infinite <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> So we're talking about John Brockman. Who is John Brockman, this mysterious man who somehow had his head plastered over posters instead of yours? John, John Brockman was the heartbeat of New York intellectualism in 1963. And he became an agent for nonfiction books and created a stable of some of the finest minds in the whole intellectual community back in the East Coast and from the academic community back there. Right, until he became what uh, most authors, hopeful authors, think of as a, the, uh, the great literary agent or as some people like to refer to him as the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> and do you have any sense of how he bamboozled Burton Bob into having his face as the face of this movie rather than your faces. Well, I know, well, I, I know, I know uh, that he suggested it. Yeah. That he, had, that he had, and I, but I, I, I never have any idea how he got smoked past Bert and Bob. I think. They bought it. What I heard was that he had come up with a publicity promotional campaign, and since the movie was called Head. Somebody said, whose head is it going to be? And he had a great look in the head, and that was. <laughs> but somebody had said, you know, let's go for this very obscure, very New York, uh, uh, Andy Warholian, right. who was, by the way, a real big fan. Andy, and and oh, did I drop yeah. that name? Oh. <laughs> Andy Warhol was a big fan, told me to my face. He, he loved it. And they were going for a very esoteric East Coast. Remember the big party and, uh, at that big fan thing where they were having live sex acts on, on the floor? I don't remember that part. That was at the premiere of Ed in New York in November of 1960. I, I remember and, being dressed up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> but I don't remember sex acts. And very cleverly, for this premiere of the, the movie in, in New York, they had rented this big, and they had every reel of the film on separate movieolas. Probably most people here don't remember what a movieola was, but it was an old school editing facility, uh, physical editing. It's like watching the movie on your phone now, but like a million of them on a big yeah. machine. And they had all the four or five reels running simultaneously because the uh, intent, as Bob and Bert told me, was that the movie does not have a beginning or an end. It is circular. You can watch it from almost any point in the movie and you come around to that back, you come around to that same spot. Circle sky. And, circle sky. And you've seen the movie. And it doesn't matter sort of where you start. So they had this big party in New York, and all the reels of the film were running simultaneously on different movie owners. So you could just stop and start and, and watch anything. So the idea, in retrospect, was that they wanted to create this sort of performance art right. idea with showing this movie and and, and, and hitting this uh, underlying esoteric, you know, you know uh, art, artsy fartsy. Andy Warhol was there, and they, and all these other people. And then, a lot of scene makers were there. I'm sorry. You got a lot of scene makers were there yeah. in Europe for now, uh, in November and, 68. And that was their idea to create this kind of a, I guess, a, a performance event, and. Bob told me to my face, I said, well, when I asked him, why did you call the movie Head? And he said, because when we make our next movie, it's going to be able to save from the producers that gave you Head. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So now, <laughs> I swear, that's what he said. 50, 50 years on, as you have just been here in Los Angeles, you sold out the Troubadour. You also did uh, yeah. the first national band. And you were also here with Nikki. And you guys are still not only singing, but you're all speaking to, you're speaking to one another still. So that's great. So 50 years on from Head, it did not destroy your careers. And look, what's next? in the world besides Ken Two. <laughs> well, you know, both me and Aaron are back into this thing, the tail end of the of the monkey's part of our life. And we share that like just like we share the monkey's part of it. And we we became friends and have remained friends, at least from my side of it. <laughs> into the line pattern that is falling out of the sky for us. And, and, and I don't guess we know really, but it, it involves music, it involves working together. You know, not to get too strange here, but I really love work, working with me. And I always have since the first time we got together. And now when we go out on stage and we play, play together and sing songs together. So it's a thrill for me. So I'm looking forward to some more days when we'll be talking about it. Right. <laughs> I can, I can be a little more specific. Uh, uh, we are we had four dates that we had to postpone recently uh, back east. Those those will be picked up in March. Uh, and then we have how many more? Eight? Eight more dates in, in the northeast and midwest. That are getting pretty well locked in. Yeah. Um, and it, it is something to say that we were out all three of us together on a, on a road show in June, the Monkey Present, the Mike and Mickey show, and Michael was not feeling great, but today he's feeling much, much better. <laughs> so I guess I'll watch the skies because we may be going to do your town. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. 